Uh, welcome. We're going to start off by going through some common organic abbreviations. So hopefully, um, just kind of getting set up for my first time this year uh, with the recording. So hopefully you can see my notes. Um, so as I said, oops, we will start with some common uh, organic, it's a little too thick, um, abbreviations. And this will help serve to, to be a bit of a warm up. So um, if you see pH on a molecule that we're talking about, that is a phenyl group, which is really just a benzene substituent. And so um, an example would be if we had uh, and by phenyl group, I mean just a benzene hanging off of a molecule. So this is this uh, yellow thing here is usually the attachment point to the rest of the molecule. So an example would be if we had phenyl OH, that would be the same as a benzene ring with an OH attached to the ring. Okay, so you have to be a little bit careful if you, you don't want to, if you have a more complicated benzene ring, let me say it this way. If you have a more complicated benzene ring, that is one with two substituents, you would not put um, like a methyl and an OH attached to the pH, so don't use pH here. So it's just a benzene with one substituent. And what I'm saying is you wouldn't want to put something like this, that would be, um, not productive. Okay, so phenyl is just when we have one thing attached to a molecule. And that's that's a nice one to start with. That's a pretty helpful substituent. So for example, if we have uh, phenyl alanine, which is a um, prote uh, which is kind of a native amino acid, one of my favorite amino acids if you have to have favorites. So I'm just drawing the molecule of phenylalanine and the purpose of this is to show that you can replace that benzene ring with a pH to give you the same molecule. And in fact, if you cross out that pH, you get alanine, which is why we call this molecule phenylalanine. Okay, so other kind of groups to consider R, we could have AR, that's for a general aryl group. Let me get warmed up on my handwriting here. So aryl group. And this is referring to any aromatic substituent. Okay, now some special ones are BN for benzyl. And so this is a phenyl group with a CH2 attached to it. So we have our connection point. Now let me just kind of redraw this a few ways. So just emphasizing the CH2, or you could think of it as a phenyl CH2. Okay, but this is benzyl. Um, we're not gonna see this quite nearly as often as phenyl, and sometimes it's just more helpful to draw phenyl, but uh, there are circumstances in some industries where they use benzyl all the time. And so it's something to kind of keep in mind. And in particular, you wanna keep benzyl, um, you wanna be able to differentiate benzyl versus benzoyl. So benzoyl, this one has a carbonyl. So this is just to use our abbreviations. This is benzyl with a carbonyl. So 
So instead of a CH2, we have a carbon attached to a carbonyl or a carbon oxygen double bond. Um, if I had to use these as examples, you could say that um, benzoic acid, which is a molecule we talked quite a bit about in organic chemistry too. Here's the structure. I know it's been a while for all of us, but there's the structure of benzoic acid. You could also draw that as BZOH. And if I redraw phenylalanine with a benzyl group, we could have benzyl directly attached to the carbon with the nitrogen. And so sometimes in the very rarest of circumstances, people will call phenylalanine benzyl glycine, but very rarely <laughs> because it just, I mean, there's already a name for it, phenylalanine that's official. Okay, so those are some important aromatic abbreviations. And by important, I don't mean like go off and commit you know, uh, a bunch of time to, to building flashcards for these, but these are things that we will see quite often in papers. And so that's why I wanted to bring them up and just getting us, it's, it's nice to get us warmed up after a break from organic too. But let's move away from the aromatic substituents and get into the alkyl substituents. So we could have bu, bu is butyl. Butyl is um, just, well, one, two, three, four carbon chain. Now, as I mentioned, this is an alkyl chain. It's not an aromatic chain. And you can see that because there's no alternating carbon double, uh, carbon, carbon double, single, double, single, double, single alterations, um, alternations along with, uh, you know, a ring and that sort of thing. So it's definitely not aromatic. We would say this is an alkyl chain. Again, just to get us comfortable with some terminology from the past. So this is also called N-bu or N-bu. And what some people will call this is just normal butyl or a normal straight chain butyl. And that's in contrast to some of the other butyl isomers. So we'll turn the page, we'll go to butyl isomers So we could have isobutyl, and that doesn't need to be capitalized unless you do the abbreviation. So maybe you maybe you want to draw your eyes a little bit better. Whatever is best for you, just so we know it's a lowercase i in front of a capital B-U. So isobutyl is different from normal butyl in that what we have is a three carbon straight chain with one carbon hanging off. So this is an isomer of the butyl chain. It has the same number of carbons and hydrogens, but different connectivity. Okay. Now another one that's very important is Tert butyl. Tert butyl. Okay, so tert butyl has two carbons attached to um, a central carbon. Let's just draw it right away. And people often call this T bu or T hyphen bu. And so this is yet another isomer of the normal butyl chain. It's different from the isobutyl chain. This one's used quite a bit because it has a um, big steric group and forms um, tertiary intermediates. Namely, if you had a if you had a tert butyl cation, the central carbon is special because it's tertiary, 
which we show is the three with the degree symbol above it. Now, the way you determine primary, secondary, and tertiary is you look at the thing that you're caring about, the carbon that you're caring about in this case is in the center, and you count the number of non-hydrogen groups attached to it. This way there are three, so it's tertiary, as opposed to if there are only one with two hydrogen groups, we would say it's primary, or one with a degree, two groups, one hydrogen um, would be secondary with a two and a degree. Okay, so that's where the tert comes from. Tert butyl is very common. Um, another one that's uh, available but much less common is uh, sec butyl. Sec butyl is um, similar to, it's kind of a hybrid of the, the, the tert butyl and the isobutyl groups. We just move the one carbon um, from each of those down the chain once one position. Anyway, here's the structure of it. And so this is sec butyl, sometimes written as lowercase s bu. We're not gonna see that one too often, so we'll move on right away and get into the next um, highly important one, and that's IPR or isopropyl. So isopropyl's um, a nice group to know. It's, I mean, we've we actually been using quite a bit of it in the past few months since the pandemic because um, rubbing alcohol is, is a very effective cleaning agent. Um, and so rubbing alcohol is isopropyl alcohol, I should clarify. Okay, so that's the isopropyl group. Um, so that one gets a star. Just some things to, I'll put stars next to the ones you really should have uh, some good, good working knowledge at your fingertips of, and that's the, the tert butyl and um, the isopropyl. Okay, so those are our alkyl groups, some other groups that we will want to um, keep in our, our uh, uh, at least be aware of, are carbonyl containing functional groups. So carbonyl groups are uh, AC, this is for A seal or acetyl. So this one's unfortunate in that it's very common. It does technically apply to two different groups, but acetyl is the primary uh, primary one. So I'll we'll put stars next to that. So A seal is a bit generic. What that's saying is we've got a carbonyl with some R group attached to it. Acetyl is um, specific for R equals methyl. And this is the one that we use uh, quite frequently. So if you see acyl, I would often think of it as acetyl. Excuse me, if you see AC as an abbreviation, I would usually think of it as acetyl, where we've got a methyl group attached to the carbonyl. So a few ways this can be drawn. And so if we think about it, there are some times that we've heard um, the acetyl prefix used in acetic acid is one of them. Acetic acid is used to describe vinegar, which has our acetyl group attached to an OH to make it a carboxylic acid. And there's several examples of this. Okay, so acetyl is an important one, abbreviated as AC. Another one that we'll see quite a bit that's a little bit cumbersome to remember, but it's a, it's a pretty popular group, and that is the TF versus the TFO. So TF is trifill. Trifill has a CF3 group attached to a sulfur, which I'll show drawn as the expanded octet, then that's attached to the rest of the molecule. What this is reminiscent of is another group called TS, which is tosyl that you may remember me mentioning in Organic Chemistry 1, where we've got the same SO2 group, but we've got it attached to a toluene ring. That's where the tall comes from. Okay. Now, if you've got, these are um, uh, sulfonyl groups. Okay. Um, both of these are examples of sulfonyl groups. And 
when adducted, and I should be a little bit more specific, when bonded to oxygen, sulfonyl groups make sulfonate esters. Sulfonate esters. So for example, if you've got TFO attached to the rest of the molecule, that's referring to a trifle sulfonate ester, which is also called a triflate. Now similarly, TSO attached to the rest of the molecule, which I will just draw a little bit smaller here. It's the same structure up above, except with an oxygen atom added. That is a tosylate. Okay, tosylate. Now both of these are sulfonate esters. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm out of space on this page. So I am going to turn the page. Just announcing that so you can pause it if you need to. Okay, so sulfonates or sulfonate esters, for example, TFO and TSO are very, it's a W, very good leaving groups. And we'll see them used quite a bit as leaving groups in the class and then as um, other types of agents, uh, but uh, they're worth mentioning here. Now what we'll do is move into, so we'll see these, we'll see these um, abbreviations quite a bit in the papers that we read and in some of the complex examples on the problem sets. Uh, again, you can go about making flashcards of these and committing them to memory early on if you want to. Um, otherwise, we can just use this set of notes to remind us uh, whatever you think is best given the circumstances. Okay, the next thing I wanna do is just briefly mention the functional groups. A nice outcome of this course is to reinforce a lot of the topics we had talked about in organic chemistry one and two related to functional groups so that students walk out of here with the ability to really look at any molecule and identify the corresponding functional groups. Certainly a, a skill that could have been acquired in organic chemistry one and two, but um, you know, time goes by. We don't often, if we're not tasked with more complicated things to do in organic chemistry, we don't often think about it. <laughs> I get it. So you may have forgotten some of this is what I'm saying. Uh, so the first one we could look at is a ketone. So a ketone is an example of a carbonyl functional group where we have a carbon oxygen double bond. And what we're going to do is put carbons on either side of the ketone. That's in contrast with an aldehyde where one of the carbons has been replaced by a hydrogen. You could actually have both of them replaced and that would give you the molecule formaldehyde, which is just one example. I usually just you know, mention that when we need to. But because that's a single molecule, not a class of molecules, I wouldn't include it here. Okay, so the aldehyde. And then yet another carbonyl functional group, there are many, is the ester, where instead of having two carbons or carbon and hydrogen, we're going to put an OR group. It's important to label that as an OR or an OC group because we want to keep that differentiated from the carboxylic acid. Which has a carbonyl, a carbon, and an OH attached to it. And again, you could put the OH on both sides, I guess, um, but that would give you carbonic acid. So again, a single molecule as opposed to a class of molecules. Amides are another class of molecules where We've replaced the
OH or the OR group with a nitrogen and that nitrogen can have either C or H attached to one or both of its positions to make it an amic. Interestingly, some people, um, some parts of the some parts of the country, they call it an amide. I, I, I think either is fine. I don't know why I've softened the eye a bit. Um, it does look like it's spelled amide, uh, but what I, I usually call it an amide. Um, whatever you would like to do, I'll understand both of them. Okay, and then um, I suppose the last one we'll mention in terms of carbonyl functional groups is the acid halide. And then I'll go, I guess, up to the top half of this page and mention the non-carbonyl functional groups. So the acid halide is a carbon and then some sort of X group where X is again equal to halogen. I say again, we mentioned this quite a bit in organic one and two, no worries though. That could be fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. Okay, so I'm gonna kind of zoom out a bit. And then let's um, see if we can cover the, the other half of this page. So um, these are going to be non-carbonyl functional groups on the right side of the page. So we could have alcohols, which is ROH or COH. I'll use R to kind of mean any carbon group. And that's in contrast with an ether. An ether has carbons on either side of it, COC. Some sulfur functional groups. We'll see quite a bit of these. These are going to be, I believe, new for everybody, but I'll just mention them. So sulfoxide, uh, we've seen this one in the Swern reaction as an example with DMSO, dimethyl sulfoxide. Um, but of all the things I expect us to have at our fingertips, um, the Swern reaction is probably not one of them. So the sulfoxide is an oxidized sulfur species that's in contrast with some of the smellier, the more reduced or less oxidized these sulfur species are, the more they're going to smell. A sulfide is a sulfur ether that is like the oxygen ether, we're going to have carbons on either side. And just to remind you, sulfur is right below oxygen in the periodic table. So its compounds are um, kind of corollaries of each other. Now, if we replace one of the carbons with a hydrogen to make a sulfur alcohol, that is a thiol. So there's a thiol, there's a sulfide. I've worked with both of these extensively. And I, that's sad because these both smell awful. So, um, I mean, one example of a thiol, I suppose, although it's not really a thiol, it doesn't have a carbon, but like dihydrogen sulfide. Okay, it's not really a sulfide or a thiol, but just H2S, that smells awful, that falls in these classes. Anytime you don't have enough oxygens in that sulfur, you're going to smell it. But if you introduce more oxygens to make a sulfoxide or some of the higher oxidation states like a sulfone or a sulfite or a sulfate, those things all of a sudden lose odor right away, which is kind of convenient. If you ever need to deodorize something, just oxidizing it with um, bleach, for example, like if you have some dirty glass where it smells like sulfur, hit it with some bleach, the bleach will oxidize the sulfur right away and then you won't be able to smell it anymore. Although it's kind of a slow process, so be patient. Okay, so um, what I want to do there is let's close down this first lecture. Uh, this first lecture involved some abbreviations and some review of some functional groups. And then um, we'll have another warm up lecture again where we uh, look at some things like formal charge and resonance, that sort of thing. We're just kind of building up before we actually get into the advanced organic chemistry topics. And again, I would encourage you that if you have questions about some of the previous material to ask me, but for the most part, don't worry if you don't remember stuff. Um, Part of the goal of this course is to kind of cement the things that you did learn in organic chemistry one and two, bring them back and make um, your ability to recall those topics a lot stronger. So anyway, have a great day.